welcome to After the Oil Machine. The issues raised in the film The Oil Machine have become even more urgent in recent months, with dramatic upheavals in energy security, the cost of living and our climate. A year on from the COP26 climate conference in Glasgow, we're going back to the film's contributors to ask them how recent global events have shaped the ongoing debate about oil. I'm Rachel Kaplan, Outreach Coordinator for the film, and I'm delighted to be joined here today by Tessa Khan. Tessa is an international climate change and human rights lawyer, campaigner, strategist, and executive director of Uplift. Before founding Uplift, she was co-founder and co-director of the Climate Litigation Network, which supports groundbreaking strategic climate litigation around the world. In 2019, Tessa was named by Time magazine as one of 15 women leading the fight against climate change. And in 2021, she founded Uplift, orchestrating their winning campaign to stop the development of the Cambo oil field off the coast of Scotland. Thank you for joining us here today, Tessa. Thanks, Rachel. It's great to be with you. Well, here we are on the eve of COP27. We saw promises made by the UK government at COP26 only for them recently to announce the go ahead for over 100 new North Sea oil and gas licenses. Are governments right to focus on national energy security in this way? Well, I think it's understandable in light of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the disruption that that's caused, especially within Europe, um, of gas supplies, that energy security is more of a priority and a bigger part of the conversation than it was last year. But I think that what is fundamentally misconceived about the approach that the UK government's taken is that oil and gas, and especially oil and gas from the North Sea, is not a plan for energy security. And there are a few reasons for that. Um, the first is to say that there really isn't much gas left in the North Sea that new licences are going to uncover. So we've had 700 licences issued um, over the last 10 years or so. And the last time that there was a licence that actually produced real oil and gas resource was in 2012. So, you know, it's a huge distraction for the government to point to a new licensing round as an answer to our energy security concerns. But I think more importantly, the government's also an, agreed with industry that more oil and gas from the North Sea isn't going to bring down the price of oil and gas that we pay in the UK. And what we have in the UK at the moment isn't a problem with supply, it's a problem with affordability. Seven million households this winter, even with the price support that the government's put in place, aren't going to be able to afford their energy bills. And when that price support disappears in April, it's expected that that will be 11 million households. And it wouldn't matter how much more gas you pumped out of the North Sea, it still wouldn't bring down the price. It wouldn't make any difference to people being able to afford it. And then I think the final thing that I would say is that if the government was serious about energy security, it would tap into and unleash what we know will bring down prices and is affordable in huge quantities in the UK, which is our renewable energy resource, namely wind and solar. And that would not only put us on a path to make sure that we don't have to worry about our energy supplies being disrupted, but it's also exactly the right thing to do to stay within a livable climate, which is also an issue of national security. At this moment when our energy bills are soaring, the production of fossil fuel energy is also decreasing and Shell just posted record profits of over nine and a half billion. How is that happening? And how can we tackle this? Well, the reason that Shell's posting record profits is just that there's been a supply on, uh, sorry, a squeeze on oil and gas supply. So the price that we and everyone else across Europe and indeed across the world are being forced to pay for oil and gas are much higher than they normally are. We've had Russian oil and gas taken off the market to a much larger degree than normal, which means that the price we're paying is much higher. It's not because of any additional skill or ingenuity on the part of oil and gas companies. It's purely a windfall or excessive profit. And so if governments were serious about getting through not just this winter, but the winter after that, which you know we're projected to experience high gas prices until at least 2025. If they were serious about addressing that, they would properly tax oil and gas companies 
to make sure we're clawing back some of those excess profits and sharing them with the individuals and families across the UK who are really going to struggle to pay their energy bills. Um, and they would, as I said, make sure that we are supporting, unblocking, you know, fully investing in the renewable energy resources that we have, which at the moment are nine times cheaper than gas. So the government's also talking about bringing in a windfall tax on renewable energy companies. Is that necessary? Well, it's understandable that in a moment of pretty profound economic crisis, like we're in at the moment, that the government would seek to claw back whatever excess profits industry are making. And it is true that um, there are some renewable energy companies, energy generators, who are making excessive profits compared to what it's costing them to generate energy. I think the one thing that the government has to be really careful about in the design of that tax on renewable energy generators, and we're yet to see the detail of that, is to make sure that they don't in any way penalise or disincentivise further investment in renewable energy, because that is, as I said, not only our ticket to energy security, it's also our ticket to a livable climate. There's a huge investment spree in oil and gas at the moment in the North Sea and beyond. So are we going into reverse in terms of getting governments and oil companies to join an energy transition to low carbon fuels? And also, what does this mean for the just transition and those working in the fossil fuel industries? Well, there are certainly some major new oil and gas projects that are up for approval in the next few years, like the Rosebank oil field, which is um, the license holder for that. It includes Equinor, which is the Norwegian oil company. Um, and that would be three times as big as Cambo. It would also involve a tax break of about half a billion pounds to Equinor and its partners. So it's really a disaster um, for the climate. And the fact is as well that 80% of the UK's oil from the North Sea is exported. So it won't be going to meet domestic energy demand either. So it is, as I said, completely misconceived as a solution to our energy security, energy affordability, um, and of course, what we need to do to stay within a livable climate. And every time the government backs new oil and gas fields to open, it defers a just transition. It defers actually putting into place a proper process to support oil and gas workers and the communities that are dependent on the industry to shift into those industries and alternatives that we know do have a long-term future that are compatible with our climate goals and that frankly are going to be much more lucrative in the medium and long term than the oil and gas industry ever will be. We know that we have to radically decline the production of oil and gas if we're going to meet the internationally agreed climate goals. Um, and so you're looking at massive stranded financial assets in terms of those new oil and gas developments and that's going to be a disaster for workers and their families um, and it's just not what's needed if we're going to get serious about a just transition. One argument put forward at the moment is that oil coming from the North Sea will have a lower carbon footprint than imported fuel and so is a positive step forward in our country's goals towards net zero. Um, is that so? Will this expanded drilling, what will that really mean for our climate and for our marine environment? Well, I mean, in short, that's really oil and gas industry spin that we should be very careful about believing. Um, the first thing to say is that the vast majority of emissions of carbon emissions associated with oil and gas production come from burning the oil and gas and not producing it. But even if you look at the carbon footprint of producing oil and gas in the UK, we are in the bottom half of the league table globally in terms of the cleanliness of our oil and gas production. Norway, which is where we get most of our imported gas from, has significantly cleaner production. The US as well, which is also a partner of ours, trade partner of ours, also has cleaner production. Um, and the targets that the industry and the government have set the industry for cleaning up oil and gas production in the North Sea are voluntary. So I don't have any faith that that's something that, you know, the industry can seriously point to as a reason to continue supporting it. The other thing to note is that we know that there are, is a significant overlap between what is being licensed in terms of new oil and gas blocks and marine protected areas in the UK. So we've got these really fragile marine ecosystems, the Cambo oil field, the Rosebank oil field, they both have infrastructure that overlaps with a marine protected area. 
in the North Atlantic. Um, and that is something that we simply can't trust oil and gas companies to sufficiently mitigate the risk of operating near and protecting. We had a lot of political change here in the UK in the last few months and a new energy secretary, Grant Shapps, and a new prime minister, a new government. Looking at the urgent need to act on climate within the next five years, what should the obligations of our new government be? If we are going to have a shot, a real shot at staying below 1.5 degrees of warming of our climate, which many people see as the absolute limit um, in terms of catastrophic, in terms of averting catastrophic climate change, then there's no room for any new oil and gas infrastructure. It's as simple as that. So existing oil and gas infrastructure, according to the UN's in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, is sufficient to take us past 1.5 degrees of warming. We can't afford to keep adding to that, which is what opening up new oil and gas fields here in the UK would do. So on that front, I think it's very clear. The other thing that all of those agencies and experts also make very clear is that the real ticket to both climate security and energy security is renewable energy. And we're lucky in the UK to have some of the best renewable energy resources in Europe, and we should be fully unleashing them, the jobs, all of the investment uh, and the tax that would come from properly developing those. With everything that's been happening this year and all the upheavals of the last few months, has this shifted any of the work for Uplift and what your priorities will be for the months ahead? Um, it hasn't. I mean, look, I'm not depressed. And the reason for that is that we are at a turning point globally um, for fossil fuels. What's happened in Russia over the last, uh, sorry, what's happened in Ukraine as a result of Russia's war in Ukraine over the last nine months, that's added yet another reason for us to get off fossil fuels. We know that they drive the climate crisis, they drive massive geopolitical instability and humanitarian catastrophe, as we're now seeing in Ukraine. Um, and relying on fossil fuels has meant that we are tethered to this commodity that we cannot afford. And all three of those things have become incredibly clear to governments all over the world this year. That's why across Europe, we are seeing an acceleration of investment in renewables. We're seeing an acceleration in energy efficiency and cutting demand for oil and gas. Um, so we are at a moment where the case against new oil and gas and our dependency on oil and gas has never been clearer. And, it's, and, and, and governments are listening to that. What can members of the public do to make change in this moment? Like what could, well, what I would could encourage I, I would encourage uh, members of the public to make it clear to the government that they don't accept more oil and gas being developed in the UK, that they see that it's not a solution to our energy security, to the energy affordability crisis that we have, and that it is the thing that is driving the climate crisis. So if they want to make that message clear, they can join, for example, the Stop Rosebank campaign, which is live now, which is a campaign to defeat this massive new oil field being opened up in the UK. Um, and they'll find that there are tens of thousands of other people, hundreds of thousands of other people across the UK who feel the same way. Thank you, Tessa Khan, for joining us today. The Oil Machine is now showing in cinemas across the UK. And you can also contact us about hosting a community screening for your organisation, your business or your group, wherever you are. Find out more at theoilmachine.org.